Hello, everyone. Welcome to World Coma Day 2023. My name is Asher Albertson. I'm a neurocritical care doctor at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. I'm honored to be here today and talk to you about the evaluation of patients with potentially reversible causes of coma. This is an incredibly important topic, and I don't intend to get all the way through it in the short period we have here today. Instead, I'd like to focus just on that reversibility part today. And in particular, I'd like to focus on the importance of rapid diagnosis and treatment, getting at that potential reversibility as it can have a massive influence on patient outcomes. Coma is a really complex illness. Causes of coma are vast, they're often multifaceted, involving multiple organ systems, multiple neural systems. And unfortunately, at this present time, they're not always reversible. However, rapid identification and treatment of reversible etiologies of coma is of the utmost importance. And I hope to really get at that today. I'll start today by just reviewing a basic framework for evaluating patients with a potentially reversible cause of coma. Then we'll move into what I'm talking about, which is using this framework to highlight a few instances where rapid diagnosis and treatment can very meaningfully improve patient outcomes. And we'll look at some of the data supporting that. So as I mentioned, evaluation of coma and coma itself is a very complex problem. There's a lot of information. It can be dizzying and overwhelming. And unfortunately, that can sometimes lead to inaction or incomplete action. Preparation and experience can certainly help with this. I believe, however, approaching these patients in a structured fashion can help uh, an enormous amount and prevent some of that inaction that comes with seeing the dizzying amount of information that these patients can present with. I wanna give credit to this paper that was published by some of the real leaders in our fields in 2014. This paper provides a great framework, provides that great structure I was talking about when it comes to uh, approaching and diagnosing these patients. The paper also does a number of great things, including provide an exhaustive list of potentially reversible causes of coma and provides an initial approach to treating these patients. I wanna zoom in on that initial framework we talked about, that initial way of starting to subdivide that big giant list of etiologies for reversible coma. The authors of this paper recommend dividing it into three categories, structural causes of coma, diffuse neuronal dysfunction as a cause of coma, and non-neurologic causes like catatonia or conversion disorder. We'll of course focus on the structural causes and the diffuse neuronal dysfunction. Let me highlight a few examples of each to help us think about it. For potential structural etiologies of reversible coma, Perhaps the first one, and the one that those of you that work in the neurocritical care field are very familiar with is acute hydrocephalus, as demonstrated by the CT scan on the right, showing ventricular megaly, clear transependable flow. Another really important one is acute subdural or epidural hematoma. Uh, you can see the demonstration on the right with really significant mass effect, and represents a very potentially reversible cause of coma. Excitingly, and relevant to new innovations in the field, large vessel ischemic strokes or large vessel inclusions um, have recently become uh, a very reversible cause of coma. On the right, you see an occlusion of the basilar artery. So in this patient, they aren't receiving blood flow to the majority of the posterior fossa. And finally, cerebral edema can be an important and reversible cause of coma. I put the reference for this image on the slide. And in this paper, the authors point out a very diffuse and atypical cause of coma being PRESS, or posterior, excuse me, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. And I understand that there's sort of a lot of interplay between these two categories, and scientifically, there's certainly quite a bit of overlap, but I think in terms of a cognitive framework, these two categories make a lot of sense. So I'll give some examples of diffuse neuronal dysfunction as a cause of potentially reversible coma. CNS infection would be a classic one. On the right, you can see very purulent cerebral spinal fluid, which has been gram-stained to show bacteria, clinching a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. I would like to talk quite a bit more about that in the coming slides. Hypoglycemia is unfortunately a very prevalent cause of, reversibly, of reversible coma or reversible depressed level of consciousness. 
Hepatic encephalopathy can be a very complex cause uh, of depressed level of consciousness in patients often with multi-organ failure. Myxedema coma would be perhaps a less common cause, but still just as urgent uh, uh, when it comes to diagnosis and reversal for patients. Opiate toxicity is a very pressing and relevant cause of coma. And non-convulsive or minimally convulsive status epilepticus is another very important cause of reversible coma, and unfortunately one that's highly dependent on resources that aren't available um, at all places that would care for these patients. So moving on from that initial cognitive framework, let's work, move on to the actions one may take when first assessing these patients. Obviously, step one is first principles, ABCs, making sure the patient is stable. And I want to pause here and emphasize something I feel, and I think many in the field feel very strongly about, in that often, especially once they're on a ventilator, once they're innovated, these patients may not look as unstable as other equally ill patients. They may not have as many alarms going off. They may not have signs of external trauma, but they are just as sick, and treating them urgently um, and quickly is just as important. So, of course, after that initial stabilization, one moves on to a targeted exam and assessment of which the targeted neurologic assessment, excuse me, targeted neurologic assessment is of the utmost importance. This needs to have a special focus on focality to the exam as well as brainstem findings. All of this together guides the next two steps, which are concurrent imaging and laboratory steps. Many of these patients, not most of these patients, will need at least basic imaging, uh, which would usually be CT imaging of the head. Concurrently, they should be getting a basic laboratory assessment, including analysis of electrolytes, analysis of glucose, analysis of blood oxygen levels, and potentially um, more specialized labs um, as well. This initial assessment in many of these patients, if it hasn't clinched a diagnosis at that point, should move on as quickly as possible to more advanced testing, be it MRI or vascular imaging, an EEG, or sampling of the cerebral spinal fluid. All of this then getting as quickly as possible to this last phase, rapid treatment. And of course, this is where I really want to focus this discussion. Treatment of potentially reversible causes of coma requires extreme urgency. I and many others in the field feel very strongly about this, and it's because of a really growing evidence and body of literature that suggests that treating these etiologies improves outcomes substantially. I will say that there is quite a bit of room for more research, as with anything um, in the critical care field, and especially the neurocritical care field, and especially coma. There's a lot of room for research here, but I'm going to present some of the evidence today that I think strongly suggests the urgency of moving to the treatment phase in reversible etiologies of coma. I want to also pause and just point out, uh, certainly looking inward at myself, diagnosing coma uh, cause or etiology is susceptible to a lot of cognitive errors. Um, and these unfortunately delay care. That can include, that may include attribution error, where we bring our own biases into the patient's room. Uh, this can lead to confirmation bias and premature closure. And it's something we all need to work as hard as we can to avoid and take in taking care of these patients. So let's move on to some examples of why I think that rapid treatment, that reversibility phase is so crucial and some of the evidence in the literature that supports this. Bacterial meningitis is an important, is a really important example of this. Delaying antibiotic therapy in bacterial meningitis substantially increases mortality. And let me show you a couple studies that demonstrate that. The first study on the left looked at in-hospital mortality and I put the references below on these slides. The first study looked at in-hospital mortality and time to antibiotic therapy. And you can see if antibiotics are delivered within the first two hours of hospitalization, the mortality in this study was about 14%, but just delaying that another four hours to greater than six hours doubled that mortality, more than doubled that mortality up to 30%. So again, these patients need a rapid evaluation and they need you need to move we all need to rapidly move through that phase those phases uh, that we talked about in the prior slide uh, this is another study which looked at all fatality in patients uh, and they called it door to antibiotic time so how quickly a patient hit the door to how quickly they received antibiotics 
And patients in this study that received antibiotics within two hours had a 5% mortality rate, but getting above 10 hours increased the fatality rate to 75%, again, emphasizing the importance of rapidly moving to the treatment phase. Viral encephalitis is another important example of this, uh, with perhaps, excuse me, perhaps HSV encephalitis being the most important example. 35%, um, at least in some of the literature I've looked at, of HSV encephalitis patients will die or be left with a devastating neurologic outcome. Of all the things that have been studied in this illness, the only modifiable factor that consistently improves outcomes is early administration of antiviral therapy. Again, similar to bacterial meningitis, emphasizing the importance of moving through the diagnostic and treatment pathway. Hypoglycemic injury is such an important example of this and such a meaningful lesson for all of us in medicine. Uh, and we really can look to medical history for this lesson. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, uh, unfortunately, um, a number of schizophrenic patients were treated with something called insulin shock therapy. These patients underwent a period of artificially induced hypoglycemia. This would, of course, result in a period of depressed level of consciousness. The doctors started to observe, though, that in patients they kept hypoglycemic for longer than 30 minutes, some of them stopped improving, stopped uh, having improvement in their level of consciousness, waking up. Because of that, they recommended a duration of coma less than 30 minutes. We, of course, now know that severe prolonged hypoglycemia can lead to a significant brain injury. Uh, Preclinical literature, basic science literature has shown that after 30 minutes of hypoglycemia, one starts to see significant necrosis and loss of neuronal activity. And of course, advanced MR imaging has shown uh, significant evidence of uh, pathology, uh, as you can see on the right with diffusion, excuse me, diffusion restriction in the lentiform nuclei and cortex. Acute hydrocephalus, uh, particularly in subarachnoid hemorrhage, is another example of this. The American Heart Association guidelines recommend that in patients with high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage and low GCS, they undergo prompt EVD placement. And indeed, I, I of course acknowledge that there's quite a bit of literature and good debate in the field about timing and management of ventricular drainage. However, the data does support that patients that undergo ventricular da- uh, drainage in this setting many of them will exhibit a a fairly rapid improvement in GCS. And of those patients that exhibit an improvement in GCS, many of them will go on to have relatively favorable outcomes. Acute subdural hematoma is perhaps one of the most important examples of rapid intervention, diagnosis and intervention. Um, Time to surgical intervention is highly predictive of recovery in these patients. One recent study suggested a time to intervention of less than three hours as being necessary at all for improvement in comatose patients. And then again, uh, as I mentioned, one of the most exciting developments in this field in the last 10 years has been the advanced technology allowing uh, new treatments of occlusion of the primary arteries of the brain. And in particular, recent data has suggested that um, recanalization of the basilar artery via thrombectomy or removing the clot uh, can be associated with good outcomes. These patients, of course, will often show up with very, very poor neurologic exams, uh, with very, very depressed levels of consciousness, and thrombectomy and uh, removal of the clot can be associated with a really significant number of those patients with improved outcomes, again, showing the importance of rapid diagnosis and rapid treatment. So with all of that, I hope I've emphasized, again, that importance of moving through the pathway from diagnosis to treatment. But I think it's important to approach this with a little bit of humility in that within the healthcare profession, we don't always do a good job with this. I have two studies here. The one on the left looked at about 100 patients who presented with bacterial meningitis, all of which had classic symptoms of bacterial meningitis. Of those patients, only 50 received the appropriate diagnosis initially. The study on the right looked at a broader at, a, at one healthcare system and looked at kind of a broader array of treatment throughout patients stay in a hospital with bacterial meningitis and noted a number of errors in diagnosis and decision-making. 
This paper highlighted one particular case, which I'd like to paraphrase here, and I think is so important. A 28-year-old incarcerated individual with history of opiate use disorder presented with reduced level of consciousness. The patient was transferred three times with a presumed diagnosis of narcotic overdose before being admitted to an ICU. He died after a short stay and autopsy revealed bacterial meningitis. So in conclusion, a wide range of pathologies may result in reversible coma. Approaching diagnosis with a cognitive framework may be helpful, and rapid and accurate diagnosis of reversible causes of coma meaningfully improves patient outcomes. Thank you all very much.